Good evening and thank you for joining Medical Channel Asia's online webinar, Doctor on Call, the Cardiology Series. I'm Shan Ping, who will be your MC for tonight. Today's session is the first out of three sessions where we have invited three doctors over three weeks to share more about their expertise concerning the heart. Today's event is proudly organized by Medical Channel Asia, your one-stop solution for Asian health information. Make sure you check out our social media pages. We are also grateful for the support of a few companies that helped make this webinar series happen. Firstly, we have Zoe, whose focus is on providing medical products and software solutions that facilitate life-saving care every day. Some of the more recognizable products of theirs that you might not notice but are around you every day will be their AEDs. But they have other innovations such as the hospital wearable defibrillator, which detects abnormal life-threatening heart rhythms and gives immediate treatment. This device is available in the hospital for those who are warded and may be at risk of cardiac arrest. Every minute matters. Check them out from their site in the chat. Next, we have Stratgeist, a digital marketing consultancy that empowers brands to achieve their maximum potential on social media. We thank them for helping us with creating such wonderful posters and collaterals for the event. Then there's roads.sg or respect others and drive safe, an interactive online community where the focus is on road safety, bring awareness and positive change to all road users. And hopefully everyone can stay a little less angsty and not get too much uh, of a high blood pressure. And lastly, SG Healthcare Heroes, an online community which started out as a collection of Singaporeans who wanted to show their support to their healthcare heroes through their illustrations during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are about 8,400 people strong now. Feel free to join their cause. With us today, we actually have around 130 attendees dialing in from all over Southeast Asia. Thank you to everyone present, and I'm sure this will be a fruitful and engaging session. Just before we begin, a little housekeeping. If you have any technical difficulties, please type your question in the chat box on the right. If you don't see it, click the single speech bubble icon. These questions will be immediately attended to by our technical support team. If you have questions for Dr. McDonald to answer, please feel free to type them in the question and answer box where it will be answered later on during our Q&A session. Note that you do have an option to send in your question as anonymous. Simply check the box, send anonymously before you post your question. For those watching live from Facebook, you can put in your questions under the comment section as well. If you would like to maintain anonymity, do send a direct message to our Medical Channel Asia Facebook page. Now, let's invite our host of the event, Mr. Jason Lim from Medical Channel Asia to just say a few words. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. Uh, big thank you to all of you who are dialing in from all across Asia, actually. I see so many joining from different countries everywhere. But more importantly, a big thank you to Dr. Michael McDonald for making this happen. Uh, tonight, he'll be sharing with us some really, really uh, uh, interesting uh, aspects with regards to our heart health. And I want to say that uh, Medical Channel Asia is very, very honoured to be able to have him as a speaker tonight. Medical Channel Asia was really conceptualised with the intention to bring good, solid, credible health, med uh, health information and medical information to Asians in general, right? And uh, Dr. McDonald uh, has been practising out here in Singapore for many years. And I'm sure he will have a lot of contacts to share with us with regard to our heart health and what needs to be done in order to maintain it even uh, during this, this period of time where everyone is very focused on their health, especially because we're in the midst of a pandemic. I hope that all of you are keeping safe. And uh, before we go into the session proper, I would like just to ask all of you who are here on this webinar tonight to do us a favor and, and go over to the YouTube channel that we have, Medical Channel Asia, where this entire webinar is going to be uploaded when it's over as well. Uh, I'd like you to go over there to Medical Channel Asia on YouTube. You will find the link in the chat box if you can see the chat function uh, in, your, in your screen right now. And just give us a subscribe on that channel. And the reason why I like to ask that is because we have a lot more interesting medical content coming up in the next couple of months. I would love for all of you not to miss any of that. 
All right. So once again, this evening, I want to say a very big thank you to Dr. Michael McDonald for taking his time uh, to share with us. I'm looking forward to not just his sharing, but to the Q&A that's going to go on later. Remember to leave questions for Dr. McDonald that he would love to answer at the end of the presentation. So thank you once again for supporting and joining Medical Channel Asia. I had the time back over to Champagne. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. So, uh, as he has mentioned, our special guest and speaker today is Dr. Michael McDonald, who will be covering one of the most common chronic lifestyle diseases, high blood pressure, and its relation to heart disease. Dr. McDonald subspecializes in preventive cardiology and heart failure, and is a certified obesity physician with an interest in complex cardiovascular diseases in overweight and obese patients. A Scottish national, Dr. McDonald trained in Glasgow, UK before moving to Singapore in 2015. So now enough from all of us and Dr. McDonald, please. Thank you, Shan Peng, and thank you, Jason. And thanks for inviting me here to talk tonight, which is um, quite excited to do this. So I'll just share my screen first of all. So I'm, yeah, I'm Mike McDonald. Thank you for the introduction. I've been in Singapore for around six or seven years. Um, I initially practiced over in the, in the Eastern Changi, and I now have my own clinic in, in Orchard. So today I'm going to talk about the silent killer, high blood pressure and heart disease. And this is something that's incredibly common and affects a huge number in the population. And often people don't even realize that they have high blood pressure. So the, what I'm going to go through today is, first of all, why high blood pressure is called the silent killer, what causes high blood pressure, how we diagnose it, and then we'll go into the risk of heart disease, because blood pressure is a risk factor for heart disease, but there are lots of other risk factors that also cause heart attacks and strokes. And then we'll look at some of the lifestyle changes that you can look at to lower your own blood pressure and lower your risk of heart disease and stroke. So first of all, what is blood pressure? So your heart is basically a muscular pump. And it pumps the blood around the body and it beats about 100,000 times every day. And around five to six liters of blood are pumped through the aorta and other blood vessels um, every minute. And every time the heart squeezes and pumps, it, there's a pressure created which pushes the blood into the aorta. And the beating heart then creates this pressure against the walls. And that's basically blood pressure. And there are two numbers that you see. When you check your blood pressure, there's the higher number, which is called the systolic blood pressure. And that's the pressure in the aorta when your heart is beating. And then you have the diastolic pressure, and that's the pressure in the aorta when your heart is relaxing. And the normal blood pressure is usually less than about 120 over 80. So there's a huge range of numbers though, and the optimal for everyone is generally less than 120 over 80. Anything less than 140 systolic is considered, still considered normal, uh, but there's a group of people that are in the high normal range, about 130 to 139. And it doesn't matter if you've got just systolic that's high or just diastolic that's high. If you reach over the limit, then you're, you're categorized as having high blood pressure. And when you have high blood pressure, we grade you based on the level of blood pressure that you have from grade one through to grade three. And each of these grades is associated with a higher risk. So the higher your blood pressure, the higher your general risk of heart attack and stroke and other diseases. And it's a very, very common condition. If you look at global numbers, about 1.6 billion people are hypertensive. And the scary fact about this is that about half of them don't even know it. And the other half, a lot of them are woefully undertreated and are put at risk of um, cardiovascular disease. And then when you look at some of the data we have from Singapore, about one in three people have high blood pressure and it gets increases as you get older. And once you're above the age of 60 or 70, it's a very high proportion of people have high blood pressure. So what are the symptoms? Now, commonly, people think that when you have high blood pressure, you get um, headaches or you get palpitations. But actually, high blood pressure generally causes no symptoms whatsoever. So it sits along in the background, causing damage to your arteries because the pressure, the high pressure, damages all the arteries. 
And this is why we call it the silent killer, because often you can have incredibly high blood pressure and just not know about it unless you check it. So why is high blood pressure a problem? So basically every single organ in the body is supplied blood by an artery. And if you have high blood pressure, it causes damage to the walls of these arteries all over the body, in the brain, um, in the heart, in the kidneys, in all the organs throughout the body. And when you damage the arteries, you get an inflammatory process and get inflammation and you get deposition of fatty plaque within the walls of the artery. And if that happens and that plaque ruptures in the brain, that's called a stroke. And if that happens and ruptures in the heart, that's called a heart attack. And these blockages can cause problems, problems everywhere. And so they lead to heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, can affect the kidneys and cause kidney failure and you end up needing to be on dialysis, can lead to blindness, erectile dysfunction, can lead to dementia and also cause aneurysms, which can rupture and cause problems. So blood pressure affects everything. And it's not, it's not usually a short term problem. It's not something that if you have high blood pressure, you'll suddenly be unwell. It causes damage over prolonged periods of time. So it's over five, 10, 15, 20 years, which is why it's important to have your blood pressure under control. So what causes high blood pressure? So when we see people in the clinic, we try and put you into one of two groups. The first one is primary hypertension, and that's basically most people, about 90% of people. And that's when there's no specific single cause. And this is largely driven by lifestyle and genetics. Then there's a second group of people, which is a bit rarer, it's less than 10%. And these are people that have secondary hypertension. And they have a cause. They usually have some form of hormonal cause or kidney cause that can actually lead to their, hyper, their hypertension. And it's important to find out who these people are, because if you can identify the cause, often you can cure the blood pressure and eliminate the hypertension if you treat the cause. So what lifestyle factors drive high blood pressure? So the, the first one is probably lack of exercise. And the, a lot of us now live very, very sedentary lives and we spend a lot of our time um, just sitting at work, working from home. And the, the other one is obesity. And the heavier you are, the more overweight you are, the higher your blood pressure gets. High salt intake is uh, another big one. And salt is often hidden in food. So we don't realize that we're actually taking it. So if you eat out a lot at restaurants, it's often full of salt. And that's partly what makes it taste so good. Um, if you have a high stress uh, in your life or your job, again, that leads to, um, can lead to high blood pressure. Your nutrition is really important. If you have a lot of processed food intake, then you're gonna, you're more likely to have high blood pressure. Smoking is another one, puts your blood pressure up. Excess alcohol, the older you get, the higher your blood pressure gets. And a big one here in Singapore is sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea is a condition where you, when you're sleeping, you maybe snore, but actually you have periods where you stop breathing. And about one in three Singaporeans suffer from sleep apnea. And most of them are actually undiagnosed. And if you have sleep apnea, about 60 to 80% of sleep apnea patients actually have high blood pressure. And it's estimated that about 30 to 40% of high blood pressure patients also have sleep apnea. So if you are diagnosed with high blood pressure, you need to ask the question, do you snore? And do you potentially have sleep apnea as a treatable cause of the blood pressure? So how do you know if you've got sleep apnea? So the signs and symptoms are, in the day, if you've got poor concentration and memory, if you get morning headaches and you feel quite irritable. At nighttime, your partner may say you, you have gasp for air or you stop breathing. Um, you also might be a very loud snorer, but there are people that don't snore that can also have sleep apnea. So any of these features might point you in the direction of actually having uh, sleep apnea as, as one of the causes of your high blood pressure. So how do we diagnose it? It's actually, it's one of the easiest conditions to diagnose. 
and we can all do it ourselves. And actually, the advice I give people in general is that everyone should have a home blood pressure monitor. And these devices you can pick up in Guardian, you can get them online in Amazon, anywhere. They're, they're usually very well validated. Ideally, you should get one that does the upper arm and not the wrist because they're slightly more accurate. And basically, when you're measuring your blood pressure at home, you want to check your blood pressure only when you're relaxed. It's not, there's no point in checking your blood pressure when you're stressed because it'll be high because your blood pressure goes up during stressful events. So check it in the morning when you're relaxed or maybe in the evening when you're relaxed. And we're looking for an average blood pressure. We never diagnose blood pressure on purely one reading. Uh, we always take a number of readings to actually provide the diagnosis. And if at home your blood pressure is averaging above 135 or 85, you have high blood pressure. In the doctor's office, we take slightly higher numbers because people get quite stressed when they come in to see us. And it's about 140 over 90. And one of the most accurate ways to di diagnose high blood pressure is with a 24 hour blood pressure monitor. It's a device that we fit in our office. And then you take go away, you have a normal day and it records your blood pressure every 10 minutes. And then we look at the average over the course of a full day. And for 24 hour blood pressure monitoring, the average is about 130 over 80. If you're above that, then you have high blood pressure. So moving on to heart disease. So blood pressure is just one of the risk factors for developing heart disease. And these green ones here are all the, the risk factors that you can look at and modify yourself in your lifestyle. I'll just run through them. So smoking increases your risk. Exercise, if you lack of exercise, it puts your risk up. If you've got high blood pressure, your risk goes up. Blood glucose cholesterol, body weight, the food you eat, very important, alcohol, psychosocial factors. And there's a whole load of other things that aren't modifiable that also increase your risk of heart disease and stroke. And they are your family history, um, your HIV status, if you're older and your ethnicity and your gender, all these things are risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Now, heart disease and stroke can be lumped together because they're both part of the same process. And that process is firing up of the arteries and developing of plaques. Now there are four things that you can do, that you can look at that will actually change your risk. And these are things that you can monitor with the help of your doctor. The first one is your blood pressure. Most people should be striving to have a blood pressure less than 120 over 80. The higher your pressure, the higher your risk. Blood glucose, the higher your blood glucose, the more likely you are to have diabetes. And when you have high blood glucose, high circulating levels of glucose cause damage to the blood vessels, just like blood pressure, and lead to early cardiovascular um, heart disease and stroke. So you want your blood glucose to be normal. It's worth checking both the glucose and the HbA1c. And the HbA1c is basically an average blood glucose over the previous three months. And you ideally want your all these to be within the normal range. Cholesterol is another one you can look at in the doctor's office. The single most important factor in the cholesterol is the LDL cholesterol. This is what everyone calls the bad cholesterol level. If you want to look, and basically the lower, the better. The, we know that in population studies that people that have very low levels of cholesterol almost don't get coronary artery disease. What you should be targeting is ideally having a cholesterol less than three, but the lower it is, the lower your risk. And this is a simple one for everyone to do at home. And that's actually to measure your, your weight and look at your body mass index. And ideally you should be striving to have a, a normal body mass index and a normal waist circumference. Because as your weight goes up, so does your risk of heart disease, your risk of blood pressure, high blood pressure, your risk of diabetes. So these four things you can actually measure yourself with the help of your doctor. And these are the four main modifiable risk factors for heart disease. So what can you do? And this is actually probably the most important section because there are really four key areas of your life that you can look at that will significantly improve and lower your risk of cardiovascular disease. The importance of these things though is actually to, to do them before you develop problems and actually use them as preventative tools. So the key areas are nutrition and weight, uh, exercise, sleep, and mental health. 
Weight's a simple one. Basically, the higher your weight goes, the higher your blood pressure goes. And if you're overweight and you've got high blood pressure, if you try and lose weight, for every kilogram that you lose, on average, your blood pressure will drop by about two over one. So if you are overweight and you get high blood pressure, it's one of the first things you should be looking to do is actually to lose weight because it can often bring your blood pressure under control. There are two diets that we consider to be heart healthy, and these are backed up by clinical trials. The first one is the Mediterranean style of eating with extra virgin olive oil. And this was a clinical trial done a few years ago. And people that went on to the Mediterranean diet had less heart attacks, less strokes, and less death. And it's basically a non-processed diet full of fruits and vegetables with fish and nuts. And similarly, there was something called the DASH diet, and this was a diet designed to lower blood pressure. And within eight weeks of people going onto this diet, they'd lowered their blood pressure by about um, five to six millimeters of mercury. And again, similarly, it's a non-processed diet, lots of fruits and vegetables and fish. And if you want to summarize a kind of heart healthy diet, basically on the left-hand side here, there's things that you want to eat more of. You want to eat more plants and you want to eat um, more fish and less red meat. And on the right hand side here, you can see the things you want to eat less of. Processed foods, anything that comes in a packet and has ingredients on it, it's considered a processed food. Red meat and processed meats, again, you should try and reduce them. They contain very high levels of salt and sugars. Try and reduce your alcohol intake, try and reduce your sugar intake and try and reduce your salt intake. And that's the kind of the nuts and bolts of a healthy diet. Exercise is more powerful than any drug for preventing cardiovascular disease. And it does so many positive things for your body. I can't overemphasize how important it is. And you actually don't even need to do a lot to get the benefits. If you don't do any exercise, just doing 10 minutes a day can significantly lower your death rate. It lowers blood pressure, it lowers cholesterol, it lowers your body weight, makes you happy, and it reduces death by about 20 to 30%. It is, it's a wonder drug that actually we should all be trying to introduce into our lives, probably daily. And the amount you need to do, as I said, you don't need to do a lot to get the starting benefits. What we advise people is generally um, five 30 minute sessions of kind of walking to brisk walking per week, plus some muscle, muscle strengthening activity. But don't, you don't need to do those things and all that exercise to get any benefit. You just need to get off the couch and go for a walk and you'll start to see benefits. This is the ideal prescription, but not everyone is able to do that. Now sleep, sleep is something that people forget, but actually sleep is very important for um, so many different aspects of your life. It affects um, your immune system, it affects your cardiovascular system and your risk of coronary artery disease. If you don't sleep enough, um, the way we define sleeping enough is that basically everyone needs more than seven hours sleep a night. There's no people that can get away with six hours without having some negative impact on their bodily systems. If you don't sleep, your stress hormones go up and your blood pressure goes up. People that don't sleep enough um, have an increased risk of um, both heart attack and stroke. If you, don't, if you don't sleep well, the next day you often eat a lot more food. You often eat maybe 300 calories extra of carbohydrates. And if you're trying to, to lose weight, you'll find that if you actually don't sleep very well, you'll start the next day you'll start to burn your own protein uh, instead of fat. So actually, there are so many um, reasons why trying to prioritize your sleep is super important for cardiovascular health. And how do you improve your sleep? So there are some key, key things that you can do. The first one is routine. You try and go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. Your body absolutely loves routine. So you set the same times and you do it every day, regardless of how well you slept the night before. There are some medications and something called cognitive behavioral therapy that can help people with insomnia. Exercise improves sleep, but don't exercise in the evening because if you exercise three hours before bed, your body temperature goes up and you, you have difficulty sleeping. Ideally, you should try and avoid caffeine after lunch because caffeine uh, lasts for about eight to 12 hours before it wears off and it does affect sleep quality. 
avoid alcohol. Alcohol, although it makes, maybe helps you get to sleep, it very clearly affects um, sleep quality and it fractures your sleep and significantly reduces the quality. Avoiding large meals at night and having a very dark, cool bedroom are actually very important. And actually, it's important also to get natural light exposure during the day because this resets your, your um, circadian rhythms. And then uh, finally, looking at your mental wellness. People that suffer from um, depression and um, anxiety do have an increased risk of um, cardiovascular disease. We know that stressful life events can increase the risk of both heart attack and stroke and high blood pressure. So looking after yourself is actually very important. The first thing is, if you have any concerns about your mental wellness, chat to your doctor and we're here to help. Try and connect with people. Staying connected is super important. Try and take time to relax yourself. Try and prioritize sleep and try and exercise. And again, if you have any concerns about your mental wellness, always come and speak to a doctor. We, we can help you. So in summary, high blood pressure is really common. It is symptomless, which is why we call it the silent killer. It leads to heart disease, a stroke, early death, and many other diseases. It's something you can easily check yourself. And I advise everyone to have a, a blood pressure monitor at home. If you want to lower your risk, start focusing on the metrics that you can control. Start, make sure you get your blood pressure checked reg leg regularly, get your lipids and your glucose checked regularly and monitor your weight and try and lose weight if you're overweight. And the key things to, for you to try and lower your cardiovascular risk and lower your blood pressure are weight loss, healthy nutrition of a non-processed diet with low in salt, getting active and exercising and prioritizing your sleep and mental wellness. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.